So what I'm going to talk about principally tonight is uh, the Urban Challenge, which was a robotics competition in the United States that had entrants from around the world uh, trying to build cars that could drive themselves. And so to show you what that looks like, I just wanted to play a little video to start with here. Uh, this is Boss. It's a 2007 Chevy Tahoe. It's been modified to have lasers and radars and GPS on it so it can look out and see what's going on around it in the world and where it is. It can navigate on roads uh, just like you or I would. It has to be able to make decisions about which lane to be in, where to go next, uh, deal with intersections appropriately. In this case, we're going to see in a moment, this is the internal representation that BOSS has of the world. So the blue lines are roads, red things are uh, obstacles like buildings, and blue pixels are curbs that it's seeing, and it understands it shouldn't drive over them. It also has to be able to park. So this is a big open area with a number of cars parked in it, and BOSS has to come in and uh, park itself uh, between two of those vehicles, and you can see how it's perceiving those with the little rectangles and red pixels, uh, and then uh, it, it has to get where it's going. In this case, there was a nice finish line it had to get to for the competition, and it does that, and because it's a prototype vehicle in a competition, we're all very happy when it goes out and comes back. So it was a pretty exciting experience. So the Urban Challenge is just the, the, the most recent in a series of robotic challenges. Um, a number of years ago, about 2004, uh, was the first Grand Challenge, which was a desert race. The idea here was to build a vehicle, again, autonomous, which means there's no remote control, there's no midget hiding under the dash driving it. It's, it's actually making all the decisions about driving by itself. There's no one telling it what to do. It had to do that while driving along trails in the desert. And the way we told it where to go is we gave it a little ribbon of GPS coordinates that it had to stay within. And then it had to look out at the world and see where the obstacles were, where the bumps were, and then you know, drive safely. And do that at speeds up to 35 miles per hour. Say on the slide, 50 miles per hour, we actually got it up that fast. But my, my knuckles were completely white, and my palms horribly sweaty at the end of that. And we said, no, no, that's enough. 35 miles an hour is pretty quick. In fact, it was quick enough that we weren't able to keep up with it if we were just driving a normal SUV. We had to also use Hummers to keep up with it because it was faster than we could drive otherwise. So eventually, uh, we actually completed the challenge. The team from Stanford edged us out by a few minutes, but our team uh, finished actually second and third in that race. And DARPA said, well, that's fantastic. Uh, we can get between places in the desert, but that doesn't do us everything we need. We actually need to be able to get in and around cities. And so they came up with the next challenge, which was this urban challenge. And this is where people got really excited, because now the vehicles weren't just driving in the middle of nowhere by themselves. They were actually driving on roads, and they were interacting with other traffic. They were reasoning about when to move and how to move and what other cars were going to do. In this case, you can see Boss pulling up to an intersection. It's waiting its turn because there was another vehicle there ahead of it, and then maneuvering once that vehicle clears the intersection. The vehicle also had to be able to park. It had to be able to pass slow-moving vehicles. Uh, it had to merge with moving traffic, so it didn't just get to deal with stop signs, but it had to actually deal with cases where the other traffic was moving through the intersection. So why would we, why would we care about this? Why would we actually want vehicles that can drive themselves? Well, the first most compelling reason is safety. Uh, the numbers for accident deaths are, are, or traffic deaths are staggering. Worldwide, there's something like 1.2 million people killed every year. In the United States, it's something like 42,000. In Qatar last year, it was 199. These are deaths that are avoidable. Beyond the safety reasons, there's a, there's a lot of other reasons. Um, the top is to illustrate kind of industry. Uh, we've dealt, we, we've, for, for many, many years, we've studied in robotics ways that we can get cars to drive around in worlds that nothing's moving in. And that's a very important problem to solve. But really, when we want to get these vehicles out and working in the real world, there's going to be other trucks, other people operating around them. And so this is kind of a cornerstone technology or a keystone technology to allow us to actually deploy robotics and actually have them do useful work in the world. So this is really the star of the team here, Boss. Um, as I said earlier, it's a Chevy Tahoe. Um, it has something like 28 sensors on it that we're taking information from and trying to allow the vehicle to understand the world around it. It has a bunch of computers in the back. In fact, right now, it's got so much stuff in the back, you can't put any luggage in it, so it probably wouldn't sell well, even if it wasn't quite so ugly. This is just a quick snapshot of the kind of sensors that are on the vehicle. On the top left, there's uh, it's a Velodyne laser. It's really it's 64 laser beams that are spun around in that big metal shell, 
and they look out into the world and they sweep a volume around the truck so that it can understand everything that's moving around it. Um, we had other laser scanners, and the way these work is like the first one. There's a laser that bounces off the mirror. The laser beam goes out, hits the wall, comes back to the sensor, and we measure how long it took for that laser to travel out and back, and then we can tell how far away that is. And we do that enough, and we spin it, point in enough directions, we build a very solid model around the vehicle of, of what's going on. And then up in the top is the system that allows BOSS to know where it is in the world. It's got GPS. So uh, just kind of the basic part of it. And then it also receives corrections that tell us when the satellites are lying to us a little bit so the boss knows where it is very accurately. And then additionally, it has some accelerometers and gyros that allow it to deal with cases where GPS uh, has, uh, has gone away because we drove under a tree or a tunnel. And just to give you an idea how many of each of these sensors we have on the vehicle, well, there's a lot. And you can imagine it's, it's non-trivial to try and make them all work together and give us a model of the world. So perception is the part of the vehicle that, un that tries to figure out what's going on around it and where it is. And there's really kind of three questions the vehicle asks. The first is, where is it in the world? Where is it in relationship to the road? And what does the road look like? The next part is, uh, what's not moving in the world? Where are the traffic cones? Where are the walls? Where are the buildings? And the third aspect of it is, where are the things that do move in the world? Where are the cars? So as an example, looking for static things in the world, um, this is data that comes from that big silver canister on top of the car, the Velodyne laser. And it's maybe a little difficult to interpret, but what, you, what I'd like you to see from it is you can kind of see the sides of the road. This, this car is right in the middle of the screen moving up it. And you can maybe pick out some, some walls on the right and some bushes on the left. Uh, and it's going past a stop sign now and it's turning onto another road and you can see that multicolored purple blob is a car. And the idea here is you get a lot of data all the way around it, so it's got 360 degree perception around the vehicle. And now this data is fantastic, but there's a lot of it. And the question now is how do you make the, the algorithms understand that data and report what's going on in the world? And in fact, the data is so fantastic that we get a million measurements per second out of it. And so sorting through all that data quickly enough that we can react to it is, is a difficult task. Uh, the way BOSS drives is it looks at the center line of the lane, that it's supposed to be driving down. And it says, I can't do a whole lot. I can either shift a little bit to the left or a little bit of right to the right of the center line. And so I'm going to consider those options. And the curves in the bottom here are the options the boss can actually drive. And then it looks to see which of those options don't bump into anything. This is just another snapshot of boss driving through the road, roads actually during the race. And what you can see is uh, there's a lot of normal cars. In fact, there's about 60 normal looking cars out there. And then there's 11 of these funny looking ones. And uh, they're all autonomous vehicles. They're, they're cars that are being driven by themselves. So how did the race actually turn out? Well, it went pretty well for us. Uh, as I think Ben mentioned, we ended up winning the challenge. And we, we did so by about 20 minutes over a four hour race. Um, and that was great. We were pretty happy with that. And if that's all that had happened that day, it would have been a nice little, nice little footnote. But what was really exciting is that there was actually five other teams that were able to complete the challenge. And the reason why this is a big deal is if one team had finished, well, you know, you could kind of write that off as a freak or as something unusual. When there's six teams that finish, that means there's actually something going on here. It means that the technology is really getting there. And that's really a big deal. That means that maybe we can start to use this stuff and get it out of the laboratory. One of the things that, you know, it, it's not all, you know, kind of uh, pie in the sky stuff. One of the things that we're working on right now is bringing a robotic car Grand Prix to, uh, to Qatar. What we're looking at is just a whole new type of beast. We're looking to have actual high speed robot racing here where you'd have cars that are driving as fast as they can on a closed loop like an F1 race. Uh, and have them compete with one another without anybody on board. And we're very excited about that. We think it's a great way to bring focus to this technology and focus to Qatar. Uh, and we'll have uh, a team that is part Qatar, part Pittsburgh, working on this to compete with entries from around the world. We'll bring the world's technology leaders for, here for this. So we're, we're really excited about this prospect.
Thank <laughs> you.